I like arts and crafts. Sometimes I get really into a project and I spend a lot of time and money on it. And sometimes that project goes horribly wrong and makes me want to flip a table. But I'm so invested in it already that I keep going even if the end product totally won't be worth it. This next speaker is going to explore why you might not want to do that with your next game development project. Jose Abalos is a game designer from Chile with seven years of experience, including work with AAA publishers and indie game developers. Jose has worked on the Disney Infinity series as well as the Call of Duty series. And now Jose will show us how we can avoid burning through money and flipping tables by beating the sunk cost fallacy and choosing a great project. Well, hello everyone. I'm Jose Avalos and thank you so much for coming uh, to my talk on how to beat the sunken cost fallacy and choosing a great project. But uh, before we start, I just want to do a quick introduction on who I am. My name is Jose Avalos. I'm a game designer with uh, seven years of professional game experience, born and raised in Chile. And I have I've worked on AAA and indie teams. So, for example, I worked first at Avalanche Software on the Disney Infinity franchise until, you know, Disney pulled the plug on it. And then I work at Treyarch, where I work on the Zombies Chronicles DLC for Black Ops 3 and then on Black Ops 4. And at this time in mid-2018, uh, I got an offer from a very good friend, like, hey, let's make an indie studio. And that's what we did, and we founded uh, Them Handsome Fellas in Chile, comprised by myself. I'm by Enrique Barrios, the two of them, two of us, like, you know, designers and programmers. And we fell into the sunken cost fallacy. And I want to talk about that experience today. So the agenda is what is the sunken cost fallacy, how we fell into it and how we got out, along with some uh, best practices to avoid falling into it and how to choose then a great project. And finally, some conclusions, reiterations and all that. So. Let's get started. First of all, what is the sunken cost fallacy? Well, before we give a proper definition, I want to define what are sunken costs. And a sunken cost in the term field in the field of microeconomics is defined as the costs that are beyond recovery at the time a decision is made. So usually in terms of game development is the time and the money that you've already spent on the game itself, on the development, by the time you make a decision. And so the sunken cost fallacy is when these sunken costs are considered instead of disregarded, which is technically the rational decision at the time of making a decision. So it's when you don't take an action because of the result of the past action, but because of the past action itself. And you can see it everywhere. The textbook example is when you buy, you know, tickets to a movie theater or anything, you know, like a week in advance and the week of the show, you don't feel like going, you don't feel too good, but you still decide to go because ah, I've already spent the money and I don't want to like, you know, go to waste. So I ah, might as well go. But then there are more drastic examples of it. So uh, on the left, we have the Concord plane. And this is a very common definition uh, because the government's involved in it. They were informed, hey, if we continue doing this plane, we're going to lose a lot of money. But they decided to go ahead with it in the hopes of recouping investment. Sunken so cost fallacy in action. And then uh, you also see it in the casinos when, uh, you know, people have lost a lot of money. But instead of going down, they decide to bet even more money, you know, to try to get some of that money back. And also in game development. And I know this is going to sound controversial, but, you know, cases like Duke Nukem Forever with its very long, difficult development history and the recent Kotaku story about, say, Skull and Bones, so many reboots, lack of direction so long that you can almost define it. Some can cause fallacy in effect. But why do we fall into this? Well, 
Uh, first of all, like I already mentioned before, it's hoping to recoup the investment if we stick to it and actually release it, which is what the gamblers do and the Concord people did. Also, because usually, you know, defining that you have made a mistake and getting a project that doesn't work, it's admitting failure. And admitting failure is painful. And even more in the field of game development, because, well, we are emotional beings. We are feel very responsible for our game success, even especially in indie teams where, you know, small teams of people. And finally, because we, uh, you know, this is more of a philosophical thing, but uh, it gives us a more flattering picture of ourselves, a more flattering self uh, story where, you know, we say, hey, uh, we stuck to it until the bitter end, you know, we, we never gave up instead of like, you know, hey, yeah, we realized it wasn't working and we made a mistake, cut our losses. So yeah, it hurts. And we fell into this. So how did we fell into this particular case? So I'm going to introduce you quickly to the game we work on called What the Pup. which was a one to four player a co-op game where you took care of the puppies and you pick them up, say, hey, I want water. And then you pick up the ball, give it some water, feed it to the dog, and then drops hearts that you have to pick up. And then you can actually pet the dog and get even more points while, you know, preventing the puppies from doing, you know, puppy stuff. And we spent in this game 15 months of development, around nine or 10 of them with uh, two artists with no playtest session, so, you know, big red flag. And, you know, that's is what we got by the end of 2020. But the story begins before, in February of 2020, when we had just moved into an office, when we had just hired our first artist who made this particularly cool GIF. You know, uh, we didn't get, like, the best response of the polisher, but it was still early, so, you know, you know, might as well just work a little bit more. And then COVID happened, the world locked down. And so we all went home and, you know, working on our own in this local multiplayer game. And given this first feedback that, oh, maybe the game isn't that fun, first red flag, what can we add to the game? And as you might think of it, big red flag, feature creep. And I'm going to explain some of the things we did uh, as part of a feature creep. One is scoring combos, where um, the amount of points you got by making a puppy happy was also dependent on the number of puppies that were happy at the same time. So it added a little bit of strategy, but we never really explained it, and people didn't understand it, so got cut immediately. A feature we spent a lot of time into was transforming into a dog. So and then you, you would go to a dog house, transform into a dog, and then you could do stuff like... Um, digging stuff from the floor, going into low spaces, but you couldn't operate some machines, so you had to switch between human and dog forms. And this was a cool thing because it added variety and cooperation, but it went against the game's core fantasy of, you know, taking care of puppies. And that was even some of the answers, we feedback we got from publishers. So it was painful, but we had to cut it. Another feature we spent a lot of time with doing uh, multi-dog stations, like, you know, a washing machine that you could wash up to three dogs at once, which added crack control, you know, with the chaos, but it went against our pitch of adorable chaos, which obviously you're going to have more if you have, instead of three puppies in a machine, you know, taking care of one while the other two do puppy things. So spending months getting cut. And finally, one thing that did work was adding obstacles like the sprinkler you saw in the video. Added to the chaos, but it didn't have any drawbacks. So, yeah, they went in. And we still didn't do any play test, which was, you know, bad. But in our case was poor bad luck with COVID because the country only started opening in September 2020, six months after. And we didn't want to risk people's health. And we couldn't even play test as a team until we discovered Parsec in October 2020. But by then it was a little bit too late, too little too late. 
And then the second red flag came, which was thinking, hey, you know, this is going bad, but we turn this around, you know. And this is something that you need to be careful because we value a lot, you know, the value of grit. You know, give it your all, guts, resilient, initiative, uh, tenacity, passion, perseverance, which are all very good values. But, you know, trying to stick to it as much as you can, even in the face of, you know, thinking that a project isn't working, it's, it's not real tenacity. It's just being oblivious to the truth that, hey, maybe the project isn't working and you're spending your time in the wrong things. And, well, we were stubborn and also thinking, hey, it was too cowardly to quit because we had put so much effort into the game. We even hired a second artist in April 2020. We doubled down on this. And, you know, seeing all the stories of, like, say, hey, um, Hollow Knight or uh, Stardew Valley, games that have spent a lot of time in development until, you know, they finally came forward. We thought, hey, one year, what's so much? Well, I mean, let's turn it around. So, yeah, we were knee deep into the sunken cost fallacy. But how we got out? Well, after showing many times the game to different publishers, you know, in 2020, uh, we finally got a lot of very, like, say, tepid response by early 2021. And this is a particular case I want to highlight. The game has a hard time understanding what makes the core loop of Overcook engaging. There's an attempt to add chaos to everything, but it just doesn't click. The levels feel very static. And finally, you're serving your demographic much better by doing a proper animal care sim with co-op than a party game. So needless to say, this was a gut punch to us. We were just knocked flat on our floors. And at this point, we got to a crossroads. Like, what do we do? Do we double down or do we, you know, cut our losses and try again? And after a week of reflection, we saw, hey, we had spent over a year on an idea and it hadn't worked out. Uh, we had made errors we could have figured out with playtests, but, you know, a little bit of bad luck again with COVID. And it still wasn't nowhere near the quality we wanted on all levels. So we made the hard decision along with the words of the wise Kylo Ren, you know, time to let all things die, bury it in the past, kill it if you must, and be back to square one. And it took us a publisher, you know, giving it this kind of harsh feedback uh, to get on it. But how can you get to this kind of decisions without, you know, waiting for a publisher to tell you this? Well, first of all, ask yourself the hard questions. And this is probably the most important one. Have I already given the project enough time and resources to succeed? In our case, it was four people, a year, more than enough time. Second question, why do we want to keep working on this? Is it because you believe in the idea or is it because you've already spent a lot of time and resources on it? The answer is the latter. You're in the sunken cost fallacy. And then does the future look brighter without this project? If the answer is yes, maybe it's a good time you know, to let it go. Second, prune the game design. You know, because feature curve is real. We fell into this, and it's a great contributor to sunken cost fallacy, like thinking, okay, we are just one feature away from turning this game around instead of like, you know, hey, refining what you already have. Third, track investments and opportunity costs, because every moment you spend in this game is time you're not spending on something potentially better. And time is our most important resource, because we are all, sorry to sound fatalistic, but... We're all going to die eventually at some point. So, you know, you might as well make the most out of the time we have. Fourth, actualize assumptions. Um, basically, ask yourself again, what must be true of this for us to turn around this project? What is this? What are we assuming about, you know, our capabilities and demographic? In our case, we were thinking, hey, by 2022, uh, people are going to be really want to be back in person and play uh, local co-op. And now, not that much. But these assumptions even valid. And all of these questions as well exposes the probability of making a successful turnaround. Whereas in the previous case, it was more of a case of why do you want to keep working on this? Along another feature, mentorship, something that isn't emotionally attached to the project that can give honest feedback because we're way too close to this. And finally, uh, making a preemptive conversation, you know, talk to the team 
and tell them at the very beginning of a project what are the possible scenarios and why the plan might be abandoned and you know actually stick to it and i'm taking case of david richards who had done this conversation you know while climbing the everest in 1996 that if the weather went bad they would go back and exactly that happened when they were just inside just a few hundred meters from the top and they decided to go back and on the way down they saw some other people going up who probably didn't have this conversation and thought hey we were so close to the top might as well just tough it out and a lot of those people didn't come back now by having this conversation he helped save his team's life now this isn't life or death because again video games but you know also saving a lot of time and money but now that we've talked about all these doom and gloom let's talk about something a little bit more optimistic how you can choose a great project and for this i want to give a special shout out to rami ismail uh who thanks to you know his consultancy services we were able to talk to him and actually start getting a good plan to get to this so what is the plan first of all spending one day with the goal of choosing three to four ideas for making prototypes for each. And how did we go about this? Well, Monday and Tuesday, days one and two, we were all at home just writing ideas, blank sheet of paper, blue sky, uh, making pitches, but not just one sentence like, oh, roguelike with uh, cosmic horror elements, but rather, you know, think through. How is it going to play? What is the feeling? What is the fantasy? Um, how the camera angle camera angle is going to be like, you know, think it through, like, you know, making a very good idea of what you want to do. Then after those two, um, two days on the third day, we got all together and all we did just just putting all of these ideas from each member of the team into a shared document and fill in the blanks, because obviously there are going to be details you didn't think through and somebody will ask you, hey, what about uh, this? Is it going to be like an isometric or third person camera? Oh, okay, and put it on the document. And this way you can also start gauging enthusiasm, how people seem fired up about one idea or another. You're going to notice this immediately. But then after the third day, the pain starts because you need to get all these cool ideas, but then you start needing to call them. For example, with how motivated the team is, seems about doing this. What is the feasibility of prototyping the main mechanic? because we were more of a mechanics focus studio instead of a narrative one. Uh, what is the market analysis? How many other games in the genre are there? Uh, how big the scope for making this game would be? And so you end up with hopefully six to eight ideas, because then the next day, you're going to roll up your sleeves, kind of like Snape here, and choosing the three or four winners that are going to be the survivors and do you know the play testing. And not just what ideas you're going to do, but also the order of development and determine, hopefully in a document, the requisites for each prototype. What is going to be the main mechanic and what things need to be done and so on. And then you start doing the prototyping. For each prototype, we spent two weeks focused on potential, not polish. As such, programmers, we were implementing the main mechanics while uh, designers, you can spend, you know, doing the environment that needs to be done, uh, what kind of interface you need to do, uh, placeholder sounds and, you know, effects for, you know, trying to give it a little bit of juice. And finally, the artists, instead of doing 3D models, just focus on making mood boards with art styles, concept art, explorations, you know, just let them go wild with how the game is going to look. And here are some tips for it, uh, for this. One, which sounds obvious, is that asset stores are your friends. But, you know, right now, art assets, sounds, UI, even engines for the type of game you want to do, anything that can help you make the prototype faster, just spend the money on it. Uh, for example, if you want to do a first-person shooter in Unity, maybe get the first-person shooter template, you know, because you got to go fast. And in the case you need an extension for a prototype, try to give yourself just a week, but tops and, you know, whatever is done at the, by the end of a third week, just leave it as is. And we did it only once for the whole three or four prototypes total. And if it's still not enough time, maybe that's a red flag that, hey, this project is going to be more complex than you thought. And that's good information to know. And finally, after you know all this period of prototypes, we spent three days carefully examining and just being ruthless all these prototypes and showing which one had the biggest potential, which one was more fun to develop for the team or stands out more from the rest of the marketplace. And these are going to be tough choices. And having a mentor can help with this too. 
Rami, in our case, also helped us, you know, distinguish more between the two ideas we were more enthusiastic about. And at first, you're going to be like, oh, yeah, this is going to be cool and everything. But by the end, you're going to be like, tired, done. So what did we do? Who were the winners in our case? Uh, first of all, we did a prototype uh, of a game mix of Zelda with House Flipper, where you go through the dungeon, all the different rooms, uh, cleaning all the enemies, and in this case, like, you know, uh, lifting the dust, uh, lifting torches, so that by the end of it, people would move in and give you, like, cute quotes and everything. So making the world's chillest dungeon crawler. Prototype number one. Prototype number two uh, was a revival of the game Blast Corp, you know, from Nintendo 64, but with the main wrinkle that we would, all the um, all, all the points you got, you could use them for power-ups, like slowing the, uh, the car, um, throwing bowling balls, move faster, get missiles, and all of that. So there was an element strategy to it. Uh, but in this case, we decided to cut it because, hey, one, making really good destruction is complicated. And second, and most importantly, because we weren't as, uh, you know, enthusiastic about this prototype. Then uh, we made a first-person shooter where you can't shoot, and your only means of defense are, you know, pairing projectiles with your sword and also, like, you know, getting the, the projectile in your hands and throwing it back. And we did it with the ultimate first-person shooter controller, and it took us three weeks. And it was fun, but we realized that the combat scenarios you could do were pretty limited. So it was cool enough as a mechanic, but not good enough to carry a whole game. So that's why we cut it. And finally, uh, we decided to make a mix of Mirror Sedge with uh, Tony Hawk. So, you know, just running around, uh, getting the combos, to slide under the buildings, so kind of like making your own parkour video. and. You know, the controls were stiff, but again, pro, uh, you know, potential, not polish. And we noticed the complexity of building good environments and realistic animations and making a good control scheme is going to be really complicated. So that's why we decided to cut it. And so the winner was the Zelda slash House Flipper game. And this is how it looks like in August. This is all done with uh, store assets. But right now you can see how you can, you know, repairing objects, um, you know, building, building, you know, with its interface, fighting, uh, you know, cutting different stuff, and then, you know, opening portals with NPCs that can even give you side quests. And so it's starting to take shape, but, you know, getting a little bit later, so we then we can start going through the pitching phase. So, in conclusions, the sunken cost fallacy is real, and it is painful as heck, but there are ways to avoid it. Giving, getting yourself a mentor, making the hard questions, especially have I given this project enough time and resources to succeed, um, tracking the opportunity to cause what you are missing by working on this project, actualize your assumptions, especially about your demographic and about the, the project itself, what you need to turn it around, and also having the preemptive conversation with the team at the beginning of the project. And for choosing a new project, give yourself proper time to research and decide along with giving yourself three to four ideas and two weeks for each prototype and be ruthless in picking one, like no mercy. And show this to other people to get their reactions as well. Well, falling into the sunken cost fallacy, it's tough, but we can get out of this and from, you know, from that pain, getting something better. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, that's my Twitter handle if you want to talk to me or yell at me, along with an email, myself personal, one from the company in case uh, you want to make some questions about this talk. Thank you very much for your time.